graduating class of 2017. It's so good to see you all out there. You've been doing a lot of listening, and I will be brief, but I do have a couple of things that I really do want to share with you this afternoon. And I am going to be serious, just so you know, and personal. I want to start with gratitude and end by inviting you to join me in thinking about a, a, a really serious and personal question. So first, the gratitude. I invite you to take this opportunity to, again, thank the people here today who love you, who are so proud of you, and who are so happy to see you have gotten to this point. These are the parents, the spouses, the partners, the children, the cherished friends who have been with you as you have journeyed on this graduate school path and who are here to celebrate with you today. So please turn to the people who know and love you and thank them for being here today. The senator mentioned that it's Mother's Day weekend. For those people who are um, in the audience who are diehard Minnesotans and also sporting people, I'd also like to recognize the fact that it's the opening of fishing season, and we're really glad you're here despite that. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the individuals here with me on the stage. These are the scholars who helped you get to this point today. And these are the individuals who collectively will be here to encourage you, to advocate for you, to recommend you for jobs, and in, in many cases, to become your lifelong mentors and colleagues. I'd especially like to recognize Professor Barbara Crosby, who will be retiring this year. Many of you know Dr. Crosby, and some of you may not know her personally, but if you are an MPA student, or if you have been engaged in any way with our leadership and management area in the school, you know that you have, but you will know now that you have been deeply impacted by her many years of commitment to the development of excellent academic programs in this, pro, in this school. Um, and one more time, I would also like to recognize Dean Eric Schwartz as he presides over his last commencement ceremony as Dean before he leaves for Refugee International in June. So please join me in welcoming or congratulating and thanking all of the people on the stage. The the congratulating part is because I think they have they get some level of credit for getting you here today. So back to you. Here's the question that I want you to reflect on as you transition from your role as graduate student to your next professional adventure. It's a big question though, just one, but it's a big one. What does it take to advance, to really advance effective policy and practice in the world? I'm not talking now about drafting good policies or conceptualizing or analyzing or writing good policy memos, all of which are important, by the way, and all of which I hope you leave here knowing something about. I'm asking you a deeply personal question. What does it take to really make it happen? And for, day, for today, I really do want you to think about this at a personal level. What does this concept of advancing effective policy and practice mean for us in our daily lives, for you and for me? as we move forward, as you complete this degree. We all want to change the world, but we all have to start somewhere, this afternoon or tomorrow, in fact. I don't have all the answers for how this happens. I have a lot of opinions, but not a lot of answers. But here's one thing that I do know for sure. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Effective public policy never happens in a vacuum. It happens in community. So I met most of you, by my count, about 75% of you for the first time when you first got to the Humphrey School and joined me in the Working in Teams class. Sometimes before you even started orientation, we were together in that class. We spent time in that class together exploring how professionals build highly functioning teams to advance a goal. We talked about order and chaos. We talked about what we can learn from deemed decision-making from organizations like Google. 
We talked about freeloaders, not that that ever happens. We talked about managing professional bullies. We talked about how to ensure accountability. And at the end, one of your class assignments was to write about what seemed most significant to you about building high professional teams, high performing professional teams. So in recent days, I went back and I reread those assignments. I really did, and it was really fun. And when I was putting names with um, what I know about you now, it was, uh, it was quite a journey back two years ago. I want to share with you today some of the things that you wrote in that assignment about what makes high performing teams. You wrote about how teams with a diverse array of people sometimes take longer to reach their goals, but the end result is better for it. Almost all of you wrote about the importance of building diverse teams with people who bring different strengths, worldviews, ways of problem solving, and personal backgrounds to the work. So here's some of your comments, your own words. Some of you will, well, obviously some of you will recognize these comments. You wrote them. One of you wrote, this class reminded me of an old saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Another one of you wrote this, it's easy to spot a good team. They are scrappy, sometimes loud, often animated. They know how to disagree and then they figure out how to move on from there and get the work done. Everyone is involved. It's even easier though to spot a bad team because they all think alike, they seem to behave alike and often they sound alike. You can almost predict the outcome of their work before they even get started. And one of you wrote this. So let me close uh, by trying to practice what I'm preaching. If you are one of those inclusive outgoing types, please know that I am not. Still, I want to work with you. You may not notice me at first, but try to see me. You are awesome and amazing, and so am I. And they close by saying, pick me for the next kickball team. <laughs> so I was sharing these thoughts about the class, about what you wrote, about my thinking about what you wrote and how I see it relating to this question of what does it take to advance really effective public policy. I was sharing these thoughts with a friend and a colleague who is an associate dean in the College of Biological Sciences. And as he listened to me, he started telling me about the Shannon Index which I had never heard of. Some of you may well have heard about this before. I had not. And how he thinks that we would all benefit from applying the Shannon Index to our own lives. So, of course, I had to say, well, what are you talking about? What is the Shannon Index? And I have to tell you, in recent weeks, I have read just about everything I can about this measure, this index, because it's so fascinating to me. So I'm going to tell you what it is. And for those of you in the audience who are biologists, I apologize for greatly simplifying what I now have come to realize is a very complex index. But here, in a nutshell, is the Shannon Index, taken right from that great source, Wikipedia. In biology, the Shannon Index is a measure of heterogeneity or diversity as an indication of well-being, strength, and sustainability. It is a quantitative measure that reflects how many different types, such as a species, there are in a data set, such as a community, and simultaneously takes into account how evenly the basic entities, such as individuals, are distributed among those types. So drawing on your comments about the value of group differences and trying to get something done, and again, I see this as directly related to my question about what it takes to advance good policy or practice, I ask you to join me in thinking about how we might apply this concept of the Shannon Index to our own lives moving forward. In your future work, you will be charged to think about this for whole communities or departments or agencies. You've heard the senator, you've heard Amina, You've heard Dean Eric Schwartz talk about what's happening in the world. We've been talking about that a lot. I want you to think about this for you, today or tomorrow. What can any one of us do to engage with people who see the world differently by virtue of their age or their gender or their political affiliation, their faith tradition, their race, country of origin, or economic status? What can any one of us do to see really see and acknowledge and leverage in a good way those differences. Realize that acknowledgement, especially when it comes to political or ideological or religious beliefs, does not signal agreement. It simply signals recognition. Seeing differences honestly 
and purely noticing the differences among us does not signal racism or sexism or ageism or homophobia or Islamophobia. There are times when in fact ignoring those differences, not seeing those differences is the far greater risk to us. I suggest we cultivate the discipline of asking ourselves, of me asking myself and you asking yourself, who do we listen to when we want to learn about the world? Where do we go for information? How and with whom do we build our network? With whom do we share a meal? Who do we invite into our homes? And then maybe we can ask ourselves, what is the dimension of this effort to build heterogeneity that is harder, hardest for us to cultivate in our own personal community, in our own personal lives? And are we willing to accept that for ourselves? Or do we want to change that? Do we want to change how we might score on our own personal Shannon index? And if we want to change that, what are we willing to do? What are we going to do to achieve it? I want to call your attention for a moment to the flags above our heads on both sides of the hall. These are the flags that represent students in this graduating class who come from countries outside of the United States. In many instances, the family members of students from these countries are also here with us today. I had the great privilege of meeting many of them last night at the HESA, the Humphrey International Students um, Association organization gathering. And I had the great honor of talking with them. And it, it also made me wonder, what can we do to continue to keep people from other countries, people with whom we've built a relationship close in our own personal networks in a way that is helping us to understand the differences that to draw on the Shannon Index are a measure of strength, well-being, vitality, and sustainability in our own communities. I have to think that if we have this discipline for ourselves, if we truly cultivate this discipline for ourselves, we may never again, for instance, see 13 people who are alike along multiple dimensions making healthcare decisions for a world that um, has people in it directly impacted by that work that don't look anything like them. So I really encourage you to think about what this might mean for you. And I want to close again by turning to one of the comments that you shared in that Working in Teams class two years ago when we first started talking about this notion of heterogeneity in what you personally do and how you personally advance the kind of policy you want to see in the world. And again, for those in the, uh, of you in the audience, one of you may recognize this um, because it invokes a parent. You wrote, when I was growing up, my mom used to always tell me about something that Arthur Ashe would say when asked how he achieved success. And he said something that I think applies to my own role in building a successful team and getting work done that I want to do in the world. And then the, one of you wrote, if I, if I don't have the quote exactly right, blame my mom. It's how she said it. <laughs> Arthur Ashe would say, start where you are, use what you've got, and do what you can today. Start where you are, use what you've got, and do what you can today. Good advice to follow. Again, hearty congratulations to all of you graduating class of 2017. I'm very proud to know you.